Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for staying as long as you have. Um, we're going to move on now to, to hear the facilitators from the working groups present some of the, the key findings or discussion points from those groups. Each presentation should last no more than five minutes. Um, and then we'll have about a half an hour, 40 minutes uh, for round table uh, discussion. Um, there were four um, themes discussed. Um, and I'm not sure which one we begin with. No, let's uh, transparency, I think, um, which was led by Nat. Accountability, which was led by Imelda. Uh, citizen participation, I think, was uh, led by Ivan. And technology and innovation, led by John Handler. Um, I'd like to remind you as well that we have these postcards, and we'd like you to uh, tell us what one change the government will have made by 2018 that will make government more accountable by 2018. Um, and we'd like you to pin them up on the notice board here before you leave. And also leave your comments on the evaluation she sheets um, by the registration table. Um, without much further ado, I will ask uh, Nat, I think, to uh, share his presentation on uh, or after discussion on transparency. Great. Thanks very much, John. Um, yes, here we are. So we, we had a good discussion um, on transparency. And anybody from the group can feel free to leap in and correct me if I've missed something out. But our top challenges that we came up with out of our group was there needs to be a culture change that there's a real barrier in terms of the, just the, the, the attitudes within the public service about, about what we mean by openness and transparency, so that, that needs to change. But at the same time, there also needs to be a bit of a culture change among the general public. People need to see that this information matters, that if we had more information about public services and so on, that it, it's a value to people's lives, that it would help enhance their, their lives in terms of the, the public services they use and so on. We recognise that cost will be certainly presented as a barrier to transparency, that you know, there's no such thing as a free lunch, and that you know, if we want to bring in more open data and so on, that there's going to be cost factors, and that has to be seen as a part of the barrier. Existing IT systems across public services are often very different. In some cases, they're very clunky, or they mightn't be designed to provide the kind of data that, that we want to see. Um, so there's, there's issues there. There's a lack of filtering tools, the kind of clever sort of online or, or other tools that would allow you to get access to a data set and search through it in order to find what you're looking for so that you might be presented with this kind of, a, this kind of barrier, which is so much information you don't know how to get through it. And then the more general question of there being a user unfriendliness in terms of the language used with a lot of public websites, the way in which data or tables can be presented. Um, often you get data which is in, a, which is in a, a, a database held by public body, but it's made publicly available as a series of PDF files that are blurred, as if they printed it out, scanned it, made it to PDF, and then made it available. And that's, that can be very frustrating. So that's kind of a, that needs to be sorted out. So those are some of the challenges and barriers that we, we saw. But then we, we turned to solutions, and two big solutions emerged. We really had a number of things which came, we came at it from different angles. A one-stop shop, the idea that there should be a central data portal, there should be some kind of directory which shows you know, what data do we have across different public bodies, and in what formats do we hold it. Um, and that you should be able to go to this one-stop shop with a theme in mind, say health or education or housing or whatever it is, and be able to explore the data and find everything there by, by in that way. And likewise, those kind of filtering tools that let you search and query for what you're looking for. So that's our a number of aspects to the one-stop shop. 
Likewise, good practice standards that data formats should be responsive. In other words, you should respond to what people are looking for. If people want a, a CSV file, a data file that they can immediately put into their own database or into their own spreadsheet for analysis, that data should be available in that way. Likewise, it should be amenable to being automatically fed through computer systems so that somebody has updated files automatically. Uh, that we need data to be available as soon as it's ready, not months down the line. There should be data release schedules so people can see when is data coming. And, and likewise, common uh, information technology standards across different public bodies. We see that as sort of a longer term, I suppose, improvement of bringing in common standards so that different computer systems can talk to each other and data can be pooled. So those were two big, big solutions, and really, I suppose, they're multifaceted. But we also had ideas such as consult the journalists, talk to people who are expert data users, experts at explaining data and putting it into context, and, and ask them, you know, what should be prioritized. Provide local data and graphics, particularly for getting the general public involved and interested. If you can show people uh, their local services, local health, local education in their area, presented simply and graphically, that that can help attract people to the whole idea of open government data. And then, on similar lines, run competitions. Reach out to the general public, say to people, look, here's a bunch of data. For a small prize, we're going to award whoever creates a, an infographic or an explanation or a good use of the data, not necessarily an app, but it could be an app, but also other, other ways of reusing data differently. Uh, and that's a way of just drawing in talent to, to innovate on how we present public data. So does anyone from the group want to step in and have I missed anything or misinterpreted? So that's, that's transparency then what we had to say about transparency. <laughs> Thanks, Nat. Very transparent. Um, Miller, can I ask you to um, talk about accountability? Um, as Nat suggested, uh, I would be very keen if my group would also jump in when I inevitably leave something out that I should have put in or put something in that I might have left out. Um, Insofar as accountability are concerned, we really looked at three areas. First, identifying what are the standards of accountability, in other words, what are people accountable for, and then how do you ensure that they conform in, uh, consistently with those standards, and then what do you do if they don't conform with those standards? I mean, they're really the issues surrounding accountability. Um, for discussion purposes, we identified the challenges as identifying standards, so precisely what are public officials to be held accountable for in various areas. Secondly, how do you engage the public in determining accurate standards or best practice standards? And one of the concerns here was that um, while public consultation takes place, it frequently takes place with stakeholders, and stakeholders may be too narrowly defined, um, and public consultation should be public rather than focusing on those who are determined to have a special interest in the area, because that's something that you can't actually determine. Um, improving financial oversight was another issue, so, so really detailed information about expenditure, etc., so you know exactly what, money, what use money has been put to. Um, identifying outcomes, if somebody is responsible for, for, for meeting a certain standard, then you should be very clear about the outcomes that you expect them to meet, both in their interests and, and in the interests of accountability. Um, assigning responsibility, it should be clear who's responsible for what, and one of the issues raised here was that there's a, a perception that power has been over-centralised, or is increasingly over-centralised, from local government to central government, and this has implications for um, accountability, because the more power is centralised, then the, the, less, the more difficult is, it is to identify the individual who is responsible for a particular decision. Um, and then finally, the issue of enforcement. How do you ensure that where, um, account where there is a lack of accountability, that the standards that have been determined are actually met? Now, obviously, we didn't find solutions to all of those issues, but we did discuss some tentative um, solutions. Um, in setting standards, we consider that looking at inter, uh, various international commitments um, set by international standards bodies and best practices in other countries could provide a guide for determining realistic accountability standards. Um, also, it is important to have a very clear, transparent legislative framework, and that requires a consolidation um, of the existing legislation. Uh, the Law Reform Commission is working on that, but it may need to speed up. Um, 
public consultation on standard setting needs to be wide and deep and facilitative. So the problem was a perception that public consultation is too narrow, but also there is a need to um, bo both broaden the, 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 the extent of the public consultation and deepen the consultation process and also facilitate consultation. So, for example, the minister mentioned letting people turn up to Doyle committees to make their points. That would certainly ease, uh, ease public consultation because written submissions are actually very time consuming to put together and may not be the most effective way of getting people to have their say. Um, EU citizens initiative, giving uh, citizens the ability to uh, propose legislation if they collect a significant number of signature signatures, uh, improved appointment processes, and then finally, um, improved account accountability mechanisms. And there's a number of issues to that. The first, as I mentioned, maybe looking again at the relationship between central and local government, um, increased decentralization so that you, it is easier to identify who, who is accountable for what. Um, improving accountability institutions and oversight over accountability institutions, so more information about what those institutions are doing and the relationships between them. Um, improved access to enforcement rec records. And then there's a, a need to uh, attack the issue of legal costs as well. Um, both various solutions were proposed, for example, um, in the area of the environment, the cap could be put on legal costs so that the, the, the plaintiff wouldn't pay more than 10,000, for example, or these solutions, but legal costs being um, a barrier to, to effective accountability and consequently dealing with legal costs, a solution lowering legal costs. So they, they were really the, the, the issues we identified in solutions. So does anybody from the group want to contribute? Okay, thank you. I, I didn't think it was possible to uh, summarize that discussion, but you've achieved the impossible. And, uh, there was one point I was going to make, um, and I'm happy to think it would be worth coming back, um, to the issue of, of standard setting in the group. <coughs> and I, I didn't um, highlight or, or draw attention to the need in my mind to articulate what we stand for as a society and uh, to to um, uh, have a, a, a discussion a public discussion on on ethical values um, which I think would be worth um, so I'm just using your time Imelda your five minutes is up um, so yeah it, it, it was one of those um, it, was, it was an issue that I didn't uh, raise during the during the uh, discussion, but thought we're raising anyway. Um, thanks a million. Um, we're going to move to uh, technology and innovation. I think John uh, was uh, facilitating that group. John. Okay, as you can see, um, we wound up with rather more than six things to write on a, and two slides, so I've cheated massively. Um, I have no doubt whatsoever and every confidence that every, anything I've missed or failed to um, suitably, to suitably um, uh, highlight will be brought up by one of the members of that group because we're not, none of us um, are very shy about expressing our opinions, it turns out. Um, let's start with, we had one in the, we've got one problem at the top and uh, and the, the top row of this um, explains is, is what was written on one card and not what was written on several other cards, so I'll annotate as we go by. Um, simplified, there is a kind of, um, a, we are at a disadvantage compared to our neighbours and peers as a nation. Um, and because the solution to this is tied up with another couple of questions, what we've said is we want we want everything as, a, as the very as the very first baseline. We want all the data that has already been established as part of the Open Government Partnership as for, and the UK's results from Phase One. That includes, and by key spatial data, we mean boundary maps, low, not very high resolution, but adequate mapping. We need. When, the, when we get postcodes, if we ever get postcodes, we need, we need those postcodes to be open. We also need spending data at a granular level from national and local government entities, um, not just budgets, but also spending data. And ideally, we'd like, we'd like those two things to be connected to each other so as we can compare one to the other. Um, 
that's almost a collection of things that, of many cards that we had um, are covered by uh, covered just by that top row. Um, and please, somebody else step in if I haven't really covered that adequately. Um, problem two: when it comes to we touching on innovation, um, Jason Rowe, wave everybody, stand up, Jason Rowe, and wave so as everybody knows who he is. Jason is one of many people in this country who has tried and currently is still trying to start an actual company using open government data at the moment. And we find out not in his particular case because you're doing all right, but if you or I were to go out into the great wide world and look for money to start such a company, they would say, hang on, aren't you completely at the mercy of whoever happens to want to hand over that data? Um, innovation in the private sector using open government data isn't very likely unless we put safeguards for the users of that data um, that are guaranteed and enforced. So what we need, and, f and we've had, and we had additional comments in the same area where you go to NDRC or to Startup Dublin or whatever, which, was it you telling me that, Deirdre? Some, uh, we've lost half our group. <laughs> um, they were evangelizing the idea of starting, government, of starting businesses or, use, or using data in business for, for these purposes and people were going, there's a culture among, among companies and, and potential companies which is um, we, we're not opposed to the idea of government of, of open data. We know what, roughly what it is. We just don't see how it relates to us directly. Um, this is the first of two big cultural questions, and the second one has already been dealt with in other groups. But there is, but there's a second. There's a culture among potential users who are not government um, that we do, that we need to evangelise and say well, that the, there are opportunities for making money in this thing, and that can be of benefit to the country at large. Um, those, but if companies are going to get involved in that, the data needs to be timely, as we discussed earlier on, it needs to be timely, reliable, and it needs to not be subject to the random whim of somebody who you don't even know who they are at some government department turning the spigot off and crapping you down the toilet um, as a company without any warning or, or comeback. We need service, we need service level agreements, as they call them, um, for data, and we need for all the, all the information that we need, that all the information that we have to be in reliable, in places where, where they can be discovered, like large central or central for local government data repositories where you can browse around rather than look for every individual department one after the other and see whether anybody's publishing something. Um, the big culture one, public sector data owners or operators having no idea, they don't know what we're talking about, let alone how to uh, acquiesce to what we're asking for. Um, that's part of the culture discussion that came up in the first of these reports. Um, we think, we don't know how, but we're only on the first of three meetings. <laughs> we need to somehow um, explain or explain to the public sector workers and government departments and local government workers in, in general why this is important and what's in it for them as well as what's in it for us because you can't argue a principle. Um, well, you can argue a principle, but you won't get anything out of it. Um, we, su we suggest part of that evangelization might be to ask to go out and ask people what the current what their current pain points are and explain how publishing open data or or working with people like us um, might actually assist them and we've we've agreed that one of the problems in the in the culture in general is that there are very few examples that people can follow um, we hear a lot of um, public sector procurement and publishing and open data and IT projects are full of examples of everything going completely wrong. And there are very few examples of this open data project from this department, in, ideally in this country but not necessarily, um, saved this department a big pile of money, created innovation in the private sector and made a bunch of money for the state in tax revenue at the end of the process. Um, that will help that second point on the bottom left-hand corner of this slide, saying that there are, and the minister did it this morning. He talked, talked about FOI purely in cost terms, not in terms of potential savings terms or potential revenue terms. Um, when Brendan Howland says that FOIs cost a lot of money, I said at the time, and you, but for those some of you weren't here, I reminded them that FOI work done on uh, done on the subject of force and how it was um, and its reckless spending at management level has saved more money for the state than every FOI fee ever collected in this country has ever um, brought in. So I mean, the same goes for data projects in general. Um, on local government, 
we have a kind of balkanized state where places like Fingal are publishing dozens and dozens and dozens, doubling is another project that is publishing lots of things, but no, there almost no data sets published by any one local government agency are published by all local government agencies, and if you're trying to use um, open government data, then you need all 34 people to be playing ball. We suggest that, amongst other things, <laughs> um, we should specify, we, we the country, should specify to local government or entities what we expect them to publish and in what formats and let them worry about how they actually deliver it. That was partly derived from a desire to get by the idea that um, trying to impose national standards on local organisations would result in jobs insecurity concerns. Um, this is an idea to perhaps dodge that. Um, we. You can read the second one of those. Um, most government departments don't even know what they have. Um, we suggest that perhaps one of the things to do um, is that they could go find out, um, perhaps by auditing all the databases and finding out what might be publishable. Um, and that's connected to an otherwise unrelated point from Deirdre that says um, that even when we have data sets, we have no metadata about those data sets. These two things are tied only on that spurious grounds. These, two, these central government data repositories should, e should have a f relatively comprehensive collection of descriptions of data sets, even if the data itself isn't there yet to go with them. And finally, um, another question that we came up with Brendan Howell earlier on. Um, Publishing, proactively publishing uh, government data and, and doing so in machine readable formats is already the government's policy. It is already policy in every national government department and they're not doing it. Um, <laughs> so we need somebody to take responsibility for making that happen and holding, de and holding departments to, the, to that commitment. Um, they need to be inf there needs to be enforcement. There also, if necessary, needs to be sanctions available to enforce against people. And um, a start, which is this, the, the last point here, says could instead of should. Um, one thing we could do is put a central government imposed ban on buying any website from any purchaser which does not feed raw data to people as well as web pages. I'm Thanks, sure John. Sorry. <laughs> Did you want to? Did anyone want to ask any questions? Or pose any comments from the group? I'm just beginning to run <laughs> Okay. <laughs> from the group, did anyone or <coughs> take questions and comments on, on the four uh, presentations? Uh, soon. Um, Ivan, you you led the group on facilitated, facilitated the group on citizen participation. Um, we've heard a lot about a very interactive discussion covering a very, very wide area in relation to citizen participation. So we've heard a lot in relation to, um, let's say, how, how processes uh, and access to data and information uh, can be made better and how accountability mechanisms can be improved, etc. And that's one take on open government. So I would put kind of a broader take in the sense and it's about what is open government about? It's about government that enables people to participate in making decisions. So we had a very wide ranging uh, discussion. Some of the points and there are many, so I haven't attempted to summarise them, but hopefully you'll be uh, interested to hear what the group had to say. Rights, do we have rights to participate as citizens of a republic? Or are we allowed? Do I need, do I need it? Can you hear me? Oh, the streaming, excuse me. There, I need it for the streaming. So do we have rights to participate as citizens of a republic or are we allowed, in some respects, uh, to participate as subjects? So accountability to electorates. Is, is accountability to electorates seen as trumping participative, uh, 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 participative forms of, of um, involvement? Changing the culture. We have a right and an obligation to participate, ourselves as, as, as citizens and ourselves as members of civil society. We've become used, perhaps, to top-down decision-making. So citizens on the sideline, uh, uh, many felt, was the prevailing culture. And really, we need, to, we need strategies to change this mindset. So this is just some general reaction that started off our conversation. 
Uh, the group felt that power was needed. Power needs to be returned to local levels where real outcomes can be shown. Uh, and a culture of institutional, governmental and ministerial, perhaps unchallengeability, uh, was felt to prevail. Local authorities need to provide more formal, creative opportunities for participation to build on all the informal participation uh, and collective and collaborative work that's going on in civil society. So a general sense that civil society has moved very far ahead of our representative uh, 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 structures in relation to, to, to creating uh, opportunities for, for participation. And there's lots to be learned by the formal system from that. Um, we need more diversity in our representative system, it was felt, uh, more age diversity, gender diversity. Citizens and youth in particular perhaps need to seek to be more informed and engaged. Uh, we have a responsibility to participate. So this is just a general sense. It wasn't all waving the finger at, at authority and power. It was accepting that civil society and citizens themselves have a responsibility to seek to participate and get involved. So we recognize that we need to be positive and constructive in our reaction as well as pointing to barriers and problems. And then uh, we, need to, we need to walk the walk. You know, again, we're perhaps very good at waving the finger sometimes, but how accountable are we uh, as citizens to each other and how accountable are civil society organizations to one another uh, uh, in relation to, to, to showing that we involve everyone in the decisions that we make and regard ourselves as being accountable too. So then we moved on to the two questions that we were asked. Uh, we looked at the problems first of all. So what were the problems, uh, that, 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 that the barriers to participation, to citizen participation, coming back to the, the grand theme? Some of the language is choice. The delusion of the elected and the collusion of the citizens in that. So we had, to, we had, uh, we had poetry in the group. Uh, the reliance on majoritarianism in making complex decisions. Why do, we, why do we insist on this majoritarian approach, recognizing that it's, it's always going to result in incomplete and ineffective decision makings in very, in very complex situations? The lack of, of education, the lack in our education system and in life generally, the lack of education at all levels in critical thinking and in particular the deficiency in relation to citizenship education. So you can see quite a different feel from the, the work that this group was considering in relation to the output of the other groups. Um, the economy, of course, takes precedence over society. This was seen as being something that needs to be addressed, is a reality that needs to be addressed. Perhaps stereotypes. People have stereotypes of, of, of people. Uh, in particular, perhaps um, perhaps elements in, of the public service have stereotypes of people in civil society groups in relation to, to you would say that, wouldn't you, or not understanding the language. Also, we operate in silos. The very language that we use in different parts of civil society can cause exclusion of others who don't share that language or understanding. And we've already heard the point made around, around um, uh, people not even understanding what open data, for example, might mean earlier. It's, there's the question of the legitimacy and accountability of civil society came up. So once again, the group very self-critical in that way. You know, do we make ourselves sufficiently accountable to the stakeholders that we engage with? Do we show by doing? Do we lead by example? Or are we always standing on the sidelines pointing the finger and then getting defensive if anybody points, points back at us? So we citizens do not have, as a right, the means to know or find out what the powerful are up to. How about that? Uh, a nice uh, short expression of perhaps one of the most fundamental issues around citizen participation and the barriers to it. The expert model, the technocracy and the techno technocratization, how would I even say that? Technocratization of information. And experts grab the complexity and exclude people from participation. So if we think about debates around the economy and if we think about debates around, um, around what's possible in relation to our economy, people can feel intimidated by the language used, by the, tech the technical language that, that for everyday, uh, co everybody's capable of talking about the economy but people will feel that they're not actually able to participate. Who would like to find themselves in a conversation with an expert economist? Is it an intimidating kind of a, 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 a conversation to try to engage in? 
So we need to, the group felt one of the priorities would be to, or, or a barrier is we need to reframe issues in simple language. We need to work to achieve accessibility if we're going to involve people in making decisions. It's about citizen participation again. So simplifying the language we use. The concepts aren't complicated. We can sometimes overcomplicate them by being too technical in our language. How can people have a sense of, ad of addressing or getting traction on the big sustainability issues? So this was a really grand point, okay? There's a powerlessness felt uh, by citizens and, and by, uh, by communities and civil society groups in relation to, we're all working on particular issues, but there's a sense of fragmentation, and this I'm, I'm certain is shared across the public service as well, a fragmentation with regards to the complexity of the challenges that we're trying to deal with as, as, as human societies. How can we find ways of integrating in some kind of a way, not unifying, but at least coming to uh, a framework, developing sh frameworks of shared understanding to tie together all of the good work that's going on in all of the different uh, civil society and public service spaces. So perhaps we need to connect the dots in relation to the many civil society initiatives that are underway and find ways of bringing them together and perhaps then civil society can provide more coherent perhaps uh, leadership uh, uh, with regard to its own engagement with, with, with our, our public servants and our public services with government and with, with ministers. There's a perception of messiness on the part of the public service, it's felt, uh, in relation to participative processes. So perhaps even today included as an example, you know. Uh, and uh, uh, because of that, these processes can sometimes be seen as tokenism. So these are, are barriers as well, and perhaps felt to be tokenistic by the very people who are carrying them out. The idea of the consultation, the report gets written up, a huge amount of enthusiasm generated, and then it gets put into a drawer and literally forgotten about. That's an exercise that was undertaken. Local government reform agenda it's felt was not taking seriously participatory initiatives. We heard about putting people first and the kind of uh, very um, tacked on character uh, that the participative initiatives that were suggested at the back of that document had. There was no sense that, that uh, county councils are going to feel any uh, imp impelled urgency in relation to implementing uh, those, those uh, options uh, as they were presented. So we turn to solutions. So that's some set of challenges for a group number one, to identify, so I want to thank the group for such an uh, amazingly rich conversation and wide-ranging conversation, and yet coherent conversation. And then you think, well, solutions, what's possible presented with a menu like that? Uh, most of us, I think, would probably run a mile. We need creative, aspirational thinking that's not restricted by current realities. So, so that's just an important observation. Uh, some of the questions that we were asked to consider were kind of, okay, so given current circumstances, what can we do kind of questions, rather than posing, well, actually, we need to ask questions around why the current circumstances have existed and uh, what in actual fact is required to make sure that those, those circumstances never occur again. So profound engagement, uh, really, in relation to creative aspirational thinking, not restricted by current realities. It's felt that, again, referring back to all of the good leadership work that's going on in civil society, that one way forward might be to identify champions. In a way, we need new paradigm champions, champions for new ways of thinking. Identify those leaders and seek to work with them and perhaps bring them together to begin this discussion about integrating frame, integrated frameworks for, for new thinking. And we need a confident public service that sees the value in all of this to engage with that. That's most important and goes without saying. How about this for a point? Prosecute the criminal misuse of power, okay? Citizens coming at it. What happened to us? The moral hazard we've introduced. We need to, it's felt, uh, take seriously uh, the criminal misuse of power that's occurred and has, has led to the circumstances we're in now. Make the representative system more connected and sensitive to views and needs and priorities of communities. So it was recognized that we have a representative system. Um, it's there. Uh, it, it is, it is uh, the legitimate system uh, in relation to voters and accountability, and it, it, it understands itself to have that role. So we, we as civil society must recognize that, work with it, and work with it to improve its own sensitivity uh, so it reflects our shared priorities uh, more effectively. There was a point that sustainability, it's all about sustainability. Ireland can't solve its problems. We're part of a, of a global um, reality and really to be looking at Irish problems in the absence of the global context is not to understand the gravity of the challenges that face us as, as, a, as, as, as human beings in the world. So sustainability 
really means rethinking the way we think about things instead of thinking of the uh, the, 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 soci the, the, the society serving the economy and the economy t uh, kind of taking place or dumping its 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 externalizing its 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 waste into the environment and, and using the environment to think of the environment in actual fact as being the framework within which society itself exists and the economy of course serving the needs of society and rethinking our our paradigm in relation to how we think about the world. New social contract for a sustainable future between civil society, government, and the market. We need a new social contract. Call it what we will. Uh, everybody, I think, understands what that uh, uh, ultimately is trying to get at. Uh, coming to conclusions, mandatory standards for accessible public policy information. That relates back to some of the feedback we've had from the, uh, from the data and information group and from the accountability group. So the group felt strongly uh, about that point. If citizenship participation is to happen, it needs to be budgeted for. So this comes back to the point about putting people first. We need to see actual budgets, uh, and local authorities need to, need to ensure that they also take an experimental approach to the introduction of new participatory methods. There's a very interesting initiative underway in County Galway, the People Talk Initiative. Uh, led by uh, uh, Edmund Grace has recently been announced up there. It's a, it's a, the concept of introducing a citizen jury. It's experimental and it's literally just been initiated. So the idea is uh, a jury of, of persons who've put themselves forward for selection has now been self-selected and that group of people will sit for the next couple of years to consider the effectiveness of their public services locally and make suggestions as to how those public services can be improved. It's got the backing of the local authorities. It's got the backing of all major political political parties, and it possibly presents us with a model for uh, participative uh, engagement at local level uh, in the years ahead, uh, and is to be applauded. Reducing inequalities felt as being a very important priority. Uh, and then this point once again made in relation to solutions. We need the broadest education possible for critical thinking and creativity and citizenship active and accepting, a citizenship, an active citizenship that accepts responsibility. So coming back to education, the themes are grand, the themes are major. We don't do enough critical thinking, we don't do enough creative thinking, and we're not encouraged to think about what citizenship means uh, and what the responsibilities that attach to citizens are. Collective consciousness begins in our own heads. Our decisions and choices do matter. We need to respect ourselves, each other, and the world. So this is summarizing some final points. Address the digital divide, seen as being a, increasingly an, exclu an, an exclusioning factor in relation to even the language used by the other groups today. Uh, for some of us, it uh, might be difficult to engage with uh, the technologies. People, some, for some people, are only just keeping up with it, including myself. Um, so we need to make sure that, that, there, that people aren't excluded from participation because of the possi possibly increasing digital divide. We need to shorten feedback loops between policymakers and citizens. So for example, introduce modern financial management uh, 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 reporting so citizens can see how the money is being spent and understand it uh, in, in straightforward uh, fashions. Multi-option decision making. This is a, was an, uh, an uh, I hadn't heard the expression before, MODM, multi-option decision making. It's the opposite of majoritarian decision making. And it's felt very strongly that we need to reflect on, uh, in a, f a, f a fundamental way, how we make decisions in our, uh, in our, our 21st century Ireland, and the adequacy of majoritarianism. And this is presented as a possible option to consider as an alternative. Two more sheets. We need to create powerful spaces and places where people actively participate in making decisions that affect them. There's a summary, okay? Pulling all of that stuff together. We need, create, we need to create powerful, note the word powerful, powerful spaces and places where people and citizens can actively participate in making decisions that affect them. Not get tokenistically consulted, actively participate, okay? And a final slide. Uh, the mandate of the elected must be counterbalanced in law by the rights and obligations of citizens to participate. How about that, all right? So a nice strong point and a, a, a easily understood one to finish on. Thank you, John, okay, and thank you to the group. Is there anything that I missed out, guys, in relation to feedback? It felt fairly comprehensive, okay? Thanks very much. Thanks, Ivan. I don't fancy the minute taker. Uh,